So um, it, it gives me great pleasure to uh, bring the panel onto the stage. Uh, we have Idris Price of SNET, who's uh, chairing. Um, we have Nick Reeks from Tata Steel, um, Hugh Williams of SPTS, and Chris Meadows of IQE. Um, so I'll hand over to Idris now, who will uh, guide us through this session. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Yes, I'm uh, delighted that on stage I, uh, I have th representatives from um, three of Wales's premier manufacturing companies. So thank you, all three of you, for, for joining me. Um, we'll, we'll give you a brief introduction on each of us just before we go into the topics of uh, the topic of digital in manufacturing. Well, I'm Idris Price. I'm a director of SNET, the Electronics and Software Technologies Network for Wales. Background is electronics manufacturing, having been so I'm known the managing director of a company in North Wales. So, if we can all give ourselves a give a, a brief introduction, please, Hugh. Hi, I'm I'm Hugh Williams. Um, I'm the continuous improvement lead for SPTS Technologies uh, here locally in Newport. Um, my background in digital in manufacturing is mainly in the information systems within manufacturing, so I've been involved over the last five years um, in things like integration of ERP systems and the introduction of manufacturing execution systems um, out on the shop floor. Uh, good afternoon. Nick Reeks from Tata Steel. Uh, for the last couple of years, I've been the IT director for Tata Steel, looking after the what we call demand side, so the requirement side from the businesses. And prior to that, I've been in the steel industry now for 25 years. Thank you. And I'm Chris Meadows from uh, IQE PLC. Uh, we're not that well known, but uh, there's a very good chance you've got a little bit of our product uh, if you're carrying a phone with you, which is probably a rhetorical question. Uh, we make wafers that are made into the chips that power a lot of computers, uh, smartphones, and uh, other digital devices. Um, but of course, we use digital, and uh, my role is um, uh, looking after a lot of our corporate services, and I've been responsible for integrating uh, a lot of services in, across the group. Uh, we are a Welsh company company, uh, but we've largely grown through acquisition, so that means bringing uh, currently 11 uh, members of the group uh, from uh, the UK, US, and uh, Asia together, so uh, obviously challenges in involved with that. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I have four topics which I'd like to, to cover. Um, one is the effect of uh, digital manufacturing on the people in the manufacturing sector, uh, legacy systems, communications, that's a technical communications, and um, perhaps an insight from each of the panel members into their vision for what digital in manufacturing is likely to be in, in the future. I'd like to start, though, with the, uh, the effect of people, so the human element. Can I ask you, Nick, from Tata Steel, to kick off, please? Sure. Thanks very much. I think um, what we're looking at from the digital perspective is we We've done a lot of technology change over the years, but we've also had some very basic systems. For people that were in the DVLA session earlier, they showed a lot of paper flow, etc. cetera. Um, that's a lot. Uh, although we are manufacturing steel, there's a huge information flow that goes alongside with that. And a lot of that was um, paper-based or all um, very silo-based as well. And what we found as we began to expand uh, technology into the workplace particularly is that the uh, number of people we've got there are huge variances in the, um, the ability of people to use systems, to understand systems, and to basically to even just to follow screens. So what we've been looking at in the digital aspects um, is the ability to increase visualization and to simplify the tasks that people need to do. Um, and some of the things we're trialing at the moment, um, not quite Google Glass, kind of stuff, but those concepts so that when people are interacting with things like SAP for engineering activity, they can also call it drawings, photos, they can see line diagrams, etc. so that not just the green screen is there, but also the rich information and the, uh, the context in which they're working. We're also working in our um, North UK plants at Scunthorpe, um, where people are putting materials into place and putting them away using their tablets as crane drivers rather than having to kind of log information and then do that task when they finally get back to their uh, workstation, when somebody else may have been in behind them and actually moved that steel, and we've lost that steel in the process flow. So this whole thing about um, simplification, uh, visualization, is a great way for us to change the, uh, the whole interaction that people have. What's the, what's the reaction of people in implementing all this digital stuff? I mean, the, the factory floor person, for example. We, we're not as far in the factory floor digital aspects as we would like to be, um, but from a sales and marketing perspective, um, it's actually 
it, it's been quite tough for them because we've moved, uh, I think we consolidated 54 websites, for example, down to two, and we brought a lot of the sales and marketing team into that space. Um, but we find now that as we've handed over more of the, um, the task to sales and marketing, to the marketing people themselves, and it's not an IT call, make, make this for me, do this for me, um, they miss a lot of the skills and they don't understand the, the importance of being right, testing it, checking it, then releasing it. Uh, so those things are difficult. Uh, from a, work, uh, a workforce perspective, um, within Scunthorpe, which is the one that we're just about to make a significant change in a minute, um, absolutely huge embrace of the change because they can see um, how they can interact better with the systems and actually improve their daily life and reduce stress. The stress caused by losing steel in the process is high because people are chasing around trying to find something and the ability to track things uh, straightforwardly, um, they're actually saying, yeah, let, let's have it as soon as we can. Okay. Anyone else? Um. Yes, um, to a certain extent, I'd agree with a lot of that. And my personal experience on the shop floor, we have, um, SPTS is a batch manufacturer, so uh, we've got a lot of labor content within the shop floor. Um, and one of the things we've sort of done recently is sort of digitize the shop floor, so pull a lot of content in. So where people were using uh, paper-based drawings, Excel spreadsheets, Word documents, and filling those in manually, um, and then maybe scanning or re-putting in data later, we've moved to a system where when they're putting data in, they're putting it into a live system. Um, but when we did that, it's surprising actually the amount of change management you need to do um, and the sort of resistance you get from people because you're changing their world. Um, so what they used to, um, they used to they used to paper the comfort of it and they go into a new screen. So you have to do a lot of training. And one of the things we found with that was the fact that when you when you roll out these systems is making sure that the people not only train, but it's good if you can integrate them into the rollout project. So when you do a conference room pilot of the software, if you can have the people involved in that, um, they don't just iron out the bugs, but find out, you know, find potential new uses for the software um, and get actually sort of buy into the software before you rolled out on the shop floor. Um, and that was quite important for us. I think we have a uh, slightly opposite um, uh, experience in some ways because uh, we're not particularly labor intensive. Um, a lot of what we do is in back office um, and actually we can run a shift with just a handful of people. Um, but actually the impact uh, in the back office has, has, has been huge. Um, and actually one thing people comment on if they come around to, to look at what we do is that it doesn't look like a manufacturing site because a lot of it is actually already automated. But actually the stresses that go on trying to get things ready and, uh, and preparing uh, the production details um, are actually probably m as much as they've ever been when it was paper-based. Uh, and in fact, I know that people still keep their paper records um, uh, to, to support the uh, electronic systems. But, but uh, I was saying, uh, just as we sat down, uh, I, I remember we, we, we went through this, um, we, I guess as humans, we all go through this sort of phase. Um, when these uh, projectors first came in, uh, I certainly used to carry around a bunch of acetates just in case. And I think that's the same with any new technology. Uh, there's always a little bit of mistrust when it first comes in and it takes a, a little while for us to get used to it and to accept and to understand um, that it can be something that, that, that will be reliable. Um, and it may just be, I'll say my age, but um, it may just be an age or generational thing because uh, a funny anecdote I've seen or heard of is, um, is a two-year-old um, girl looking at a, at a traditional magazine and wondering why it doesn't seem to work because trying to swipe it, nothing's happening. So I think what's happening is we're seeing these generational changes and I'm sure that a couple of generations uh, behind it'll be a case of expecting everything to be digitized and what, what is paper? So I, th I think we'll see those changes. I, I do think it's evolutionary rather than ev uh, revolutionary though in that um, we talk about digital digitalization as if it's going to be a magic wand that's suddenly going to change everything. I think certainly in manufacturing but I'm sure uh, listening to the previous um, debate on, uh, on healthcare uh, I think it's probably we're talking maybe decades before we actually get to a position um, where everything is fully digitalized. So I, I don't think we're looking at an overnight revolution on these things. Well, we've heard from uh, two different types of manufacturers, really labor intensive. And Chris, where you don't have many shop floor workers at all. But I think the common theme is effects on people, isn't it? And adoption. And um, so many organizations don't, I believe, put enough effort into the human aspect of it. I think, Nick, you were leading on this earlier on. Yeah, yeah, I think there's general agreement on that. I'd like to move on to um, 
to um, legacy systems and uh, what do we do with so many of these older systems that are already in use and uh, in place when trying to implement new digital technologies? Who would like to go first? Well, since I'm holding the mic, uh, I'll kick off. Uh, I, guess, I guess from our point of view, um, as I mentioned uh, to start with, um, we've, we've grown largely through acquisition, but also um, with some new startups. And uh, certainly with some of the acquisitions uh, of uh, large American corporations, uh, we've actually bought a part of a company, part of a large company. Um, and so we've inherited systems that not only are legacy and quite often uh, a long way out of date, um, they're actually integrated with other parts of systems. and. I think it's very easy to underestimate the work involved in being able to extricate yourselves from one existing system and then to update it and then to make it compatible with other systems. Um, and this is a, a process that we've been through many times. Um, as I say, we have uh, 11 members of the group, um, five in America, four in the UK and two in Asia. Um, and as you can imagine, um, most of those have actually been acquired over the last 10 years. And I would say that we start off with uh, the best intention of completing projects and uh, full integration within maybe um, a few weeks if we can, I would say typically we're talking a year to 18 months before we actually get close to the, the full integration. We just bought some uh, operations in Scandinavia and we have less than 12 months to carve out their uh, system, so uh, yeah, <laughs> well less than nine months now and counting. Legacy um, is a big deal for us, obviously. Um, we have systems dating back now 30 and 40 years. We're highly reluctant to make changes to them um, because they, they work in many cases uh, and they work as part of a wider uh, infrastructure that, that we operate. Um, one of the guys this morning talked about going over the top uh, and that's one of the strategies that we've been actively deploying for the last 18 months. We've identified uh, what we want in terms, particularly in terms of customer interaction or for employees to have more access to information and data. We've been building more connectivity and more hubs that sit between the new world and the old world. So we can take the strain off the old world in terms of legacy and people start moving and customers particularly start moving to operate with systems that are digital or web-based um, and we're using integration hubs um, from technology partners like OpenText um, to help us in that journey so that we can have a buffer between the legacy and, and the new world. Um, I think my experience with legacy or one of the... Um I think is always the things that you don't know uh, when you're doing a software implementation. So when, um, about five years ago with SPTS, when it was formed as a company, it was formed out of uh, two companies actually based in Newport that were the same company about 26 years ago. Um, so what happened was when we re-merged the company, um, when, they, when they went their separate ways 26 years ago, they took the same part numbering systems. Um, and for 26 years created part numbers so that when we came back together and wanted one Oracle system, then suddenly we had a lot of machines to put back together. And we had this sort of unknown thing, well, how do we get all these part numbers that are now the same but completely different things working on the same system? Um, so that, that brought up a lot of interesting, um, interesting challenges for, for SPTS as a company. Um, we got through resolving them by different sort of techniques and sort of maybe renaming part numbers, but I think that's, uh, whenever you look at integration, it's those sort of things you can never, you can never predict. Um, I think everybody thought it was a simple thing. We, we had the software and we were ready to go, okay, let's have a look at the data. And when you come to clean the data, that's, uh, that's where you often find your problems um, and the things you can't predict. Following on from legacy, looking to the future, um, and from your company's perspectives, or personal, what would be your vision for digital in manufacturing in the short term and medium term? Um, for my, in the short term for my company, um, <clears throat> one of the things that we're looking to do is sort of leverage what uh, leverage the systems we've taken on um, in that we've gone digital on the shop floor. So we've got manufacturing execution system, which we've had for 18 months. And it's, so I would say it's now becoming a mature system, but it's the data that it's generating and what we do with that um, and what we've never had the ability to do before as a company. Um, so as we grow as a company, we, we're shipping more machines, so it allows us to do more statistical analysis. So there's potential to do um, to look to look at that and improve our test processes. Um, 
longer term, it's more difficult because we're such a labor intensive uh, company, I would say for um, on a personal level, it's very difficult to predict what it's going to be because it's going to be labor intensive um, unless what we actually do increases in volume um, exponentially and sort of justifies that need to um, digitize or actually put in robotics um, to manufacture. Um, but I think that's, I mean, you know, in general manufacturing, that's what we seem uh, we're looking more at. And I, I think we were talking earlier about Industry 4 um, and uh, what the consequences of that will be on manufacturing and the potential for bringing manufacturing um, back to sort of Northern Europe. Um. Uh, well, short and long term. Um, I hope, first of all, there is a long term for steel. <laughs> that would be the, the first challenge. Um, in terms of the short term, the absolute focus for us would be to use as many of the digital applications and digital tools as we can to uh, speed up the customer focus journey that we've got within um, Tata Steel at the minute. As a traditional steel company with a high production kind of base and, a, and production focus, we've been working very hard the last two or three years particularly to place customer product, customer development much more at the center of what we do. The digital tools that we've seen allow us to do that. They make information more transparent. They answer questions like, where's my steel? for customers and, and help that self-service piece, um, but they also help to improve the communications around the company. In the short term, um, we are a big user of Microsoft Link, um, which was mentioned earlier this morning. So Link, Yammer, et cetera, all of those collaboration techniques within the company and particularly focused on increased um, customer activity. That would be the short term piece because that's something we can tangibly do. In the long term, yeah, manufacturing 4.0, um, smart industry, smart steel, et cetera. Uh, certainly, the, the claim is that productivity in the UK can go up by 20% if we um, really deploy the digital tooling effectively. That's what we're trying to unlock. Um, that would give us a truly sustainable manufacturing base as well. I think uh, from, from our point of view, in the, uh, in the short term, it's really all about data. Our, our business is really about IP. So although we're not labor intensive, it's about the knowledge of what we do. So we're not really selling a product, although there is a tangible product at the end of it. What we're selling is our knowledge and know-how of how to put that together. Um, and as we have acquired companies from around the group, um, we've learned from those, but it's the data that's central to that. So in, in, in some ways, uh, we're trying to do what uh, an Apple or a Google is doing um, more generically with any information they can find, but we're trying to do that specifically with information within our, uh, our own manufacturing processes. Um, a lot of what we're doing is, is effectively atomic engineering, so we can't actually see, touch, feel, or even measure um, some of the parameters, so we have to build up um, our knowledge of uh, some of these areas. Uh, it, it's actually a lot of it's based on quantum mechanics, so no one really knows or understands exactly how it works. Um, but we know that if we do the same thing time and time again, it'll do, uh, have the same output. So it's by gathering more and more data that allows us to refine the processes um, and to do them much more accurately. Um, and so that's something we've been doing uh, for some time, and, and I think in the short term that's something that's going to grow a lot more. Um, but in the long term, I think the, the big thing for us is going to be the Internet of Things, and it's a virtuous circle because we're making the products that should enable it, but also in turn those products that are enabling it should help us to improve our processes. So uh, I think we'll see a lot more embedded systems, a lot more integration of um, both our systems, but also the chips that enable them. Um, hopefully one day your handheld device won't be a handheld device, it will just be there somewhere, either sewn into clothing or implanted somewhere. Um, and communication and everything will just be second nature to us. Just picking up on the point about data, um, I was recently with um, one of the former Apprentice uh, finalists and he was talking about his new company and what he was doing and essentially um, how he was cap uh, using the data to drive uh, washrooms and the hand dryers that go into washrooms. And those hand dryers also have video capability. And when people walk in, the, the video capability within there connects to their device through Bluetooth or NFC and then says, okay, you're so-and-so, I'm going to show you this ad, I'm going to show you this corporate piece. They also used all of the data to say when it's used, how it's used, how long it's used, the times, etc., etc. His whole business is based around data. He happened by accident to be producing hand dryers. That was his byproduct, producing physical hand dryers. Um, but his actual business was all on data. Now that is a fundamentally different way of looking at manufacturing. Thank you. Um, 
A couple of you mentioned Industry 4.0. I don't know how many of you in the, in the audience here know anything about Industry 4.0. It's so, if you look it up in Wikipedia, it says uh, Industry 4.0. Where has the 4.0 come from? And it says it's the fourth industrial revolution. And it's about sort of the smart factory, mass customization, and so on. I'd like to ask each of the three panelists, are you as an organization looking at it the industry 4.0, and if so, where are you on that journey? Um, I mean, um, from my point of view in SPTS, I, I don't think we are. Like I said, we, we're very labor intensive. Um, so in terms of the way that 4.0 looks at it, we're probably not. But the interesting thing, and a bit like uh, IQE, I guess, is, is that what our machines are doing probably is um, powering 4.0. So if you look at where we sell our machines into the semiconductor industry and, and niche parts of that, <coughs> um, they're, pred they're predominantly used to make sensors, um, advanced packaging of chips. So that's where you, um, you stack uh, semiconduct semiconductor chips and devices on top of each other so that they, so that basically you can put things in smaller formats um, and they can, so you can put memory and a chip into the same format and they'll talk to each other. Um, and also, um, so they are the sorts of things that will probably drive um, industry pop. And it's the sort of things that sense the world and can make sense of that and use that data. Um, so I think um, that's probably where sort of SPTS fits in with it, where, um, yes, we probably don't see ourselves, but we're probably driving it. That's good to hear. Um, we have a German CEO, Karl Kohler, and um, Karl's quite connected to where a lot of this has started in Germany. So he's been working with some of our technical team to understand what it could mean for us. So we are looking at uh, manufacturing 4.0. We're trying to understand um, what kind of infrastructure we need for it, because there's quite a large infrastructure required in terms of the connectivity and the data. And then the third thing is, so what? So I connect all my machines, and I connect all my coils, and I connect all my steel products. What then am I going to do with that information? How am I going to use it? What does it do for customer service? What does it do for supply chain efficiency? So we're in a stage now, we're kind of saying, yeah, no, we, we can see some good things. Which ones actually make a big difference to us? Um, but we're, we're, we're down the road. I think uh, some of our team are talking to government organizations in the UK, but there does clearly seem to be a much stronger push from some of the government organizations in Europe and in the US in this space for manufacturing as well. I think ultimately, um, yes, uh, Industry 4.0 will play a part in, in our, our production processes, albeit probably at the periphery. So we'll probably buy equipment and I, I guess SPTS equipment will have some uh, interconnectivity built in um, over the next decade. Or so it's, it's probably going to be something that's, that is relatively standard. Um, but strangely, from what is a fast-moving industry, uh, the semiconductor sector um, has actually uh, been pretty poor over the years, or actually it's been pretty good at inventing standards because there are so many of them. Um, there's something called semi-standards, which have generally been adopted, um, but uh, Again, uh, some of it is piecemeal. I think before that, something called Smith Technology, um, which I, I guess is still in use, but um, it's, it's an industry that's now about 50 years old, so still relatively new. Um, but uh, I think in terms of standard manufacturing, it's really still uh, inventing itself and trying to understand how um, to, to become much more efficient. So in some ways, it's, it's a long way behind steel and other engineering um, uh, areas, but uh, I think it's learning quickly. Okay, yeah, this um, Industry 4.0 is, is suddenly in, in the news and quite a, a topical topic, but as you're saying, Nick, it's, uh, it's probably led from Germany, isn't it? I was talking to um, the Managing Director of Siemens Automation very recently, and they seem to be pushing it very hard, obviously, led in Germany, and, and I guess Siemens are looking for, for business from it. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Industry 4.0 has also said of smart customization and um, mass customization. Does it offer the UK the opportunity for more manufacturing? It's not specific perhaps in the context of your own businesses, but do you think it does or is it a fad? 
Uh, I think it's more than a fad, um, but as I say, within our industry, we've certainly seen um, a number of initiatives like this. Uh, I think it offers opportunities, whether it's specific to the UK and whether we can do something with that um, remains to be seen. Um, in itself, I don't think it will actually prompt more manufacturing um, or people to enter manufacturing because there's a standard there. Um, but I think uh, existing manufacturers will start to embrace it. And the knock-on effect is that suppliers to those, so maybe third, second and third tier suppliers, um, will start to adopt the same technologies. And hopefully it'll make them um, smarter. Um, and in, in so doing, um, make them more competitive because we often say the biggest threats are from the Far East, in particular from China and so on. They're adopting very efficient models. Um, they will probably adopt uh, Industry 4. So I think that's going to be the big driver for, first of all, the larger organizations, but then for that to filter down into um, hopefully startups, but uh, the smaller organizations that support them. So I think it will have an impact at some point. As, as panel members, and if we were if we're having the Minister of the UK government here for, for business, what, what message would you give in relation to Industry 4.0? Should we, as the UK, be embracing it as it is? Should we be changing it or should the government be throwing money at it? The views I express are not those of Tata Steel. <laughs> um, no. Um, we should absolutely be in embracing it. There's no doubt about that. What would we be changing about it? I think uh, some of the things that we heard uh, this morning in the main speeches as well, particularly about the importance of STEM and the importance of creativity, etc., the way that computing and digital is taught in schools, those are the areas that need to be um, dealt with. Probably also in adult education to support workforces because I, I don't believe in it that it's age, it's attitude. But, you know, and, and there is a group of the, uh, the workforce that wants to learn but can have the access to learn about digital capabilities to exploit it for manufacturing or other companies as well. So it needs to do that and it needs to look at the educational side and the support side that can do with that. Clearly, it's already doing a great deal. The events like today, we've heard about things called tech hubs, etc. So there are things that can be, uh, can be already be used. So it's about making sure that they continue to be promoted and funded, I guess. Okay. Um, I mean, yes, what I would say is the, the thing we hear quite a lot in the news is the productivity gap. The fact that, you know, the UK economy is not as productive as it should be, or is not as productive as it was um, before, before the crash in 2007, 2008. So really, as, as a government, you'd have to be looking at any, you know, you'd have to be looking at these initiatives of Industry 4.0, um, and you have to be looking at all the things. It. So it's, not, it's sort of digital. How do you, how do you, how do you get your, how do you, how do you get your networks? How do you get your business to work together? It's things like, okay, so what's the future looking like? You know, people talk about 3D printing. Is there an opportunity there? Um, is there an opportunity to make things uh, productively in the UK? Um, you know, the things like, if you talk something like 3D printing, is this something in 10, 15 years' time? Does, does that become a, a disruptive industry which can take out things we do today with CNC machines turning traditional industries? Um, and when you look at that, there's probably the potential to think, well, if we can do this in the UK, we use, it, we use less material, well, suddenly, then in the UK and Northern Europe, um, you, you have to think, well, when we move into low-value economies, we're taking out the shipping. So, you know, you... There's, there's, there's technologies out there that can use it. It's, uh, it's, I think it's very much about the UK being able to, being able to seize that opportunity and bring manufacturing, uh, bring manufacturing back, um, or sort of increase the manufacturing base of the UK again. Thank you, thank you all. I could go on asking questions for these three gentlemen for the next 10, 15 minutes, but um, I know we're getting close to the end of the session time, so I'm going to throw it open to you to ask any questions. If you could put your hand up, there is a roving microphone if anyone has a question. Um, okay, that's quite a challenge. Um, I would, interestingly, I would hope that, um, to turn that on its head a bit, I would hope that what we are doing and some of the things we're doing in the SPTS, we actually become a disruptor in some industries. Um, it's not something I can really talk about here, but there, there, are, there are certain things within uh, microelectronic, uh, microelectrical, mechanical devices and small sensors. 
um, and the way that you use the machines that SPTS builds are going to become disruptive. Um, and I think those technologies can um, maybe um, sort of disrupt some industries and there's, a, there's an advantage out there. So I, I hope that's... A, I hope that's the way it goes rather than our industry becomes disrupted. Okay. Um, within a three-year context, for what? Um, the application of big data and, and steel in use. Um, so the, the, chemi the properties of steel, how they could be changed, etc. And somebody has the opportunity from a steel context to provide new products into the marketplace faster than we can. Because steel, I think, is a quite a slow cycle in terms of replacement. In the longer term, definitely 3D printing, nanotechnology, etc. Though, and the um, uh, the graphic, graphene, those things are the longer term issues to for us either to play in as large scale manufacturers or to be dis completely disrupted by. And uh, pretty much the same, actually. Um, uh, funny you should mention graphene. I was going to say the same thing, in that uh, we are a materials company and we specialize in semiconductor materials. Uh, graphene shows a lot of promise. Uh, I think it's also shown a lot of hype. Um, but at some point, it's going to come through and deliver some goods. And, uh, uh, and as uh, with SPTS, uh, it'll be the equipment that's used to process that. And we're a materials company, so we would expect to be a disruptor um, rather than be disrupted by that. Um, but we want to play into uh, whatever new technologies come along and uh, we've been a driver and the semiconductor industry has been a driver through Moore's law for the last 50 years. Um, I think uh, a comparison which I don't really like to make but uh, is I, I think it was um, Bill Gates said that uh, if the uh, automotive industry had kept a pace with the speed of developments in, um, in computing then a car would drive something like a million miles on a gallon of fuel and cost something like 10 pence. Um, unfortunately if you put any analysis analogy too far, uh, you get the response. And I think um, uh, General Motors came back with, yes, but every now and then you get the screen going blue for no apparent reason. You'd, you'd have to press the start button to stop it. So uh, you just don't push it too far. <laughs> We've run out of time. Sorry, so no more questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed.